All right, guys, here we are. You will not believe this, but we are actually at our last new material lesson. Y'all should be extremely proud of yourselves. You've made it through a very difficult year. And here we are on the last full day talking about the end of unit nine, okay? As you guys probably remember from our last lesson, unit nine's kind of interesting, all right? Globalization is pretty much the entire theme of your childhood. You guys grew up with the transportation technology, airplanes, cars, shipping containers, all right? The communication technology, internet, cell phones, all that fun stuff, stuff you remembered. You guys are deeply influenced by things like vaccines, medical innovation, birth control, all that stuff is new and important stuff, especially here at the end of period four, okay? Guys, there's a few more things about period four we need to talk about. A lot of them have to do with free trade and trade organizations and things that kind of keep the world moving, all right? As we've talked about, trade is obviously a critical theme throughout AP world history. So let's get started. But first, what do we have in front of us? You guys might not know this, but this right here, this little uh, blue earth thing that seems a little upside down, that is the logo of the United Nations, all right? The predecessor organization to the League of Nations, okay? So we'll talk about them a little bit today, as well as other important organizations. So guys, we are still in unit nine. And as I said, this is the last new lesson. From here on out, everything you learn in this class will be things that we've already discussed, okay? Um, when you guys get back from spring break, we are gonna hammer down into um, the material you need to know. We're gonna really, really dig back into period one, period two, and period three. Start with a meme. Um, I don't have any information on your DBQs yet because at the time I'm filming this, we obviously have, I haven't even taken a DBQ. But if you were in class, we'd be doing our DBQ post-mortem, talking about what y'all did well and what y'all didn't do well. Now we're gonna finish up unit nine and then I will assign y'all to your class work. So one eh meme for you. That Spanish flu, 1918. <laughs> Okay, guys, so every one of these leaders down here, you should probably be able to recognize every single one of them. We've talked about all of them, okay? We've talked about Franklin Delano Roosevelt. We've talked about Vladimir Lenin, Joseph Stalin, Indira Gandhi, Adolf Hitler, Ronald Reagan, and Deng Xiaoping, okay? But what you need to be able to do with the information you have about these leaders is understand their the way that they approach the government's role in the economy, okay? Do these leaders see their role as, um, you know, the government should be involved in the economy or do they see their role as the government should not be involved in the economy, okay? So those that practiced the idea that the government should indeed be involved in the economy, this is the list. Franklin Delano Roosevelt in the United States, through the process of the New Deal. He is a firm believer that the government should be involved in the economy, okay? Vladimir Lenin and Joseph Stalin over in the Soviet Union, all right, with their um, new economic policies followed by Stalin's five-year economy, they believe that the government should be involved in the economy. Indira Gandhi, a socialist, also heavily influences um, the money supply going into the economy. Adolf Hitler, all right, corporatism into the economy. Now, on the other side of this, this dichotomy are the free market capitalists. So the unregulated capitalists, the ones that want the government to stay out. All right, Ronald Reagan, who's famous for saying the problem is government, okay? He did not want the government involved in the economy. Deng Xiaoping, despite the fact that he is a communist, is also a free market capitalist, also wanted to make sure that the Chinese government was not involved in the economy, which is why he invited so many foreign companies to come into communist China. Guys, make sure you know this list, okay? These leaders are important. You need to know their ideas about government and what it means for the economy, okay? Now, I keep 
I feel like a lot of times in the class, I keep talking about this concept of free trade, but I've never really adequately explained it to you. So I want to make sure I do that now. What is free trade? Well, context clues suggest that it's free. Not like, you know, this is $5 and this is nothing, but freedom. Okay, free trade is a trading policy. And essentially, it's a trading policy that does not restrict imports or exports. So when you um, bring in goods from another country, that's an import. When you send goods to another country, that's an export. All right, free trade does not restrict bringing in goods or sending out goods, okay? This seems very basic. I don't know really why this is an important thing. It is, all right? Many countries impose things called tariffs as a way to raise tax dollars on things that come into a country or things that leave a country. Free trade does not allow any barriers. It doesn't allow any sort of tariffs, any sort of unreasonable taxes. All right, there's no sort of embargoes. There's no refusals to buy things from other countries. No, free trade is this. If you wanna buy all of your cars from Mexico, the government's not going to tax you to bring all of your cars from Mexico, okay? A free trade agreement is a pact between two or more nations to reduce barriers on imports. That's exactly what I'm saying, okay? Mexico, the United States, and Canada have a free trade agreement. Anything that is made in Canada can be sold in the United States without any of these barriers, without any of these rid silly, ridiculous taxations. Guys, under this free trade policy, goods, services, um, these are bought and sold across international borders, okay? So that means, again, you're not having to pay tariffs. You're not having to pay additional taxes. You're not having to meet quotas, subsidies, or any sort of prohibitions on these exchanges, okay? Anything can be sold across these borders regardless of, oops, I lost my pen. All right, so guys, we need to talk about some institutions that promote trade. So in period four, new institutions will be created. And these institutions are going to heavily promote the idea of free trade, okay? Free trade, again, is sort of similar to what happened in period one on the Indian Ocean trading route. Remember, think about all those people selling goods and buying goods along the Indian Ocean trade prior to the Europeans monopoly. People are not getting taxed. They're able to just sell things, like no problem, okay? Now, these institutions that are gonna happen in period four, and we're gonna talk about them, are going to really, really push governments to stop prohibiting um, imports and exports from other places, and instead to encourage more and more trade, um, more and more trade, lower prices, higher prices, okay? One of the most important trade organizations is the WTO, okay? The World Trade Organization. This is an international organization and it's gonna promote free trade between states, okay? Um, so essentially, you know, if, if you guys are friends, you're part of the World, World Trade Organization, this organization will try really hard to promote um, free trade, okay? Another one of these new tr institutions that promote trade is called NAFTA, okay? NAFTA is the North American Free Trade Association. Now, NAFTA occurred between the United States, Canada, and Mexico, okay? Actually, in the 1990s. And so this is a regional free trade agreement in the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. Now, NAFTA takes a lot of flack here in the United States, okay? Okay. Um, every time you go down to downtown Columbus and you see those old mills, the ones that have been turned into loft apartments, people always see those and they think, you know what, they took our jobs and they sent them to Mexico because of NAFTA. And that's true to an extent, but NAFTA actually had a lot of positive things that happened. So again, if you're a factory owner and NAFTA goes through, and basically that means you can trade things um, between Canada, Mexico, and the United States without having to pay extra taxes or extra, um, you know, tariffs. Why the heck wouldn't you take your textile factory and move it to Mexico where you can pay people a lot cheaper than you'd pay people in Columbus, Georgia? Obviously, you're going to move it to Mexico. 
Therefore, you can sell all the goods that you make down there up here for lower and lower prices. Now, the problem is, is that means you're going to lay off a lot of workers in Columbus, Georgia, and that's going to make people unhappy. However, what NAFTA ended up doing was it created more and more people in Mexico had better jobs now, right? All those factory jobs go to Mexico and people are kind of making more and more money than they, they could have before. And all of a sudden we have the creation of a middle class and these middle class people in Mexico, right? They have the money to buy computers and cell phones and tech technological equipment. And that stuff is made in the United States. So because you've made Mexico a little bit wealthier, you're able to sort of bring up that society. All right. And naturally that means they're going to buy important and expensive stuff from the United States. So again, NAFTA tends to take some flack for destroying American manufacturing jobs, but actually we got service jobs out of it. And that's really important too. Now there's a couple other institutions that are going to be promoting trade, but I want to make sure you guys understand what free trade is. All right, it's a massive global economic growth. And this has occurred as free market practices have spread. As I just gave you guys the example, the NAFTA example. The pros are this, you're gonna have more economic growth. In that example, because these factories have moved to Mexico, because they're now paying their workers a little bit less, but still more and more people are making more and more money, we're gonna have an increased economic growth, all right? That means people have more jobs and they don't have to rely on the government as much anymore. Okay. It's also going to be a transfer of technology, which is going to help other societies to kind of increase. But of course the cons are this job outsourcing. So again, all those jobs from those factories in Columbus are now being sent to Mexico. Obviously this originally means poor working conditions. You're paying people very, very little. All right. It's also going to be the degradation of natural resources. Now, something also that kind of grows from these free trade agreements are knowledge based economies. So here in the United States, we are a knowledge based economy. This is kind of a pinnacle of this sort of capitalism thing. All right. So let's think about Columbus, Georgia. Let's think about that example I just gave you. All right. The factories. All of those factories leave Columbus, Georgia, because they can't afford to pay their workers high anymore. So they move to Mexico and they pay their workers. Okay. But what does that leave in Columbus, Georgia? Well, that leaves behind some people who don't have jobs, but it also forces other people to go and get educated. All right. So these people who might have become factory workers, instead, they're going over to CSEA or they're going to Auburn or UGA and they're learning how to become lawyers and doctors government officials. And so eventually some of these economies are going to sort of evolve into economies um, that are past the stage of industrialization. And now these economies focus on providing services. All right, I'm a teacher, I provide a service. When you go to the doctor, that doctor's providing you a service. Lawyers, okay? You know, most of your parents are probably profiting from this knowledge-based economy. Your parents work at TSIS or Aflac. They're providing a service. They're not slumming it up in a factory anymore, okay? They are providing a service because this economy in the United States requires education, especially a highly educated modern workforce. People who can understand how computers work, okay? That's providing a service. Workers here are required to be flexible and problem solvers. Wages are often a lot higher as well, all right? People who provide a service tend to make a lot more than those that sort of work in a factory, all right, manufacturing. So what are some knowledge-based economies? Well, obviously, the US of A, Japan, and Finland. Now, I think I told you guys last week when we talked about, um, when we talked about the political organizations that target civilians, I said that one of the things that Al Qaeda specifically targets is Western culture. All right, so Western culture has basically become the globalized culture. Okay, globalized culture. Think about all the things in the United States that you, from the United States that you can get elsewhere. 
hey, you can go get a mocha frappuccino in Tokyo, Japan. You can get a Big Mac in Indonesia, in Jakarta, Indonesia. Okay. You can get, I don't know, anything you want. You can get a Whopper in France. All right. You can get Taco Bell in place, places in Africa. This is a globalized culture. This is Western culture spreading. All right. The United States wins the Cold War and therefore political and society, social liberalization also win. So again, throughout the 1990s, all of these things, these Western companies, these Western um, cultural components are going to spread throughout the rest of the world. All right. And it's not just McDonald's or Starbucks. It's also pop culture. Okay. Everybody knows the Beatles. Everybody knows Lady Gaga. Everybody knows Taylor Swift. Okay. That is because globalized culture, especially American culture has spread globally. Okay. You see art, entertainment, and pop culture everywhere. You know, it's not just American culture either. I, I love the fact that now everybody listens to K-pop. K-pop is now a globalized sensation. We can't really understand it, but it's super catchy. We all love our BTS. Okay. Facebook, pretty much everyone in the world outside of China has a Facebook account. Okay. Well, maybe if you're over the age of 35, you have a Facebook account. All right, people have Twitters. Twitters have always, Twitter has always been used as a way to kind of spread information, okay? Another really interesting one is the World Cup, all right? I know in the United States, soccer is not really our jam, but when the World Cup a few years ago was playing, I think there was something like 3 billion people in the world were tuning in to watch this, this, this worldwide soccer phenomenon, okay? That is globalized culture. And all of a sudden, our cultures, our languages, our religions, even though some of it, there's some subtle differences there, there's still um, a big enough change. Now, consumerism and consumer culture also becomes globalized. As I told you guys, you can pretty much go to a convenience store in any country in the world and pick up a Coca-Cola. What's super interesting, and Coca-Cola is kind of our pride and joy here in Columbus, Georgia, right? Made over down in the historic district at uh, Pemberton's Pharmacy. Coca-Cola is this brand that is distinctly American, right? Except that Coca-Cola, in order to save money, they pretty much built bottling plants all over the world. So I'm sitting here drinking a Coke right now. But if you went to France and you bought Coca-Cola, they don't ship it in from the United States. They have their own bottling plant in France, in China, Mongolia, Indonesia, Malaysia, you name it, there is a Coca-Cola bottling plant. And that is what globalized culture looks like. Toyota, a Japanese car company, okay? Toyota, like Coca-Cola, makes money because it is a global recognized brand. But they also don't build cars necessarily just in Japan. Sure, if you buy a Toyota in Japan, it will probably be made in Japan, but Toyota also has companies around the world that will put together cars in different countries. It's like right down the road, we have a Kia plant over in West Point. Kia is a Korean company, and yet you can buy a Kia, a Korean Georgia built car. It's pretty interesting. And yet there are some places that actively resist globalization. All right. The Chinese social media app Weibo is basically the antidote to Google. Now, I told you guys the story about how I went into Tiananmen Square and said the word Tiananmen Square out loud and got in trouble. Okay. You go in China and you go on Weibo or you go on Yahoo or you go on whatever search engine that they allow you to use at the time because Google don't exist. And you try to search for things, you know, certain kinds of freedoms. Um, the Tiananmen Square Massacre, if you look for um, other sorts of social media that's considered maybe too free, you're not going to be able to find it. So yeah, globalized culture is a good thing, but there are countries that still actively are going to resist this, okay? Now, y'all remember after World War I, the Treaty of Versailles created something called the League of Nations. And I all told you that the League of Nations was a fiery clustered disaster. Well, the United Nations is going to be the sort of, uh, now we're going to fix this. All right, so after World War II, 
uh, a new international organization is formed and this thing is called the United Nations. Okay. Now, how do you get an organization to work? Well, you basically do the opposite of what you did the first time. All right. Every country is going to join the UN now. And the goal of the UN is to keep the peace. All right. To keep open dialogue between nations. Okay. The UN, yes, it does condemn some countries, but for the most part, it doesn't really harshly penalize countries, which is why everybody still wants to remain part of the UN. It's a way that everyone sits together and actually opens up this dialogue. Now the UN has actually, um, it's still somewhat controversial, especially in the United States. Um, the UN is actually in New York and a lot of Americans don't really like the UN. They don't want to be a part of the UN. But in all seriousness, the UN's actually increased in effectiveness, especially at the, um, the end of the Cold War. But of course, um, there are some countries that don't necessarily want to sit down at a, at a table and be told they're going, they're wrong. And you're going to see some um, issues at the UN, especially between democracies and totalitarian states like modern day Russia and modern day China. Guys, the UN, um, one of the things that the UN did was they created this universal declaration of human rights, okay? It's not just paper. This is a really, really interesting document, okay? If anybody is a member of the United Nations, they have encountered the Declaration of Human Rights. It is a document that protects women, children, and refugees. Now at its heart, this document is important because it takes the sort of American ideas of um, equality for all and kind of throws it back at the rest of the world. So basically this, this document, this Declaration of Human Rights says, the founding idea of human rights is that all are going to be created equal regardless of race. This document is written in the aftermath of World War II, specifically, this document is written in the aftermath of the Holocaust. They want to make sure everyone is aware that irregardless of race, we are all equal. Okay. After the Holocaust, we need to make sure that Germany is condemned for what happened. And that is what this is right here. Okay. Now, going hand in hand with human rights, we have lots of new human rights um, events going on. In 1965, well, actually throughout the 1960s, um, ooh, actually, this is wrong. This should be 1963, guys. In 1963, the United States is going to pass the Civil Rights Act, okay? The Civil Rights Act um, is one of several bills that occur in the 1960s, which are huge successes for the civil rights movement. Okay, the Civil Rights Act of 1963 outlaws discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, national origin, and later, actually very, very recently, um, sexual orientation and gender identity have been inputted into the understanding of the Civil Rights Act of 1963. Okay, this was a huge moment for Martin Luther King Jr. All right, this is the moment when the United States government declares um, separate but equal to be wrong. Okay. Now there are other increases in human rights. All right. Women, especially in period four, women have lots of new rights. There is a global increase in female literacy. More and more women will gain the ability to read. All right. I know all of you guys are familiar with Malala, all right, but it goes even further back. All right, women are also at higher, 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 more and higher rates of higher education. Okay, even today, I think there are now more women entering college than men. Okay, I gotta be honest with you. When I got my PhD in November, I was one of only two women in my department. Um, there was me and the first African American female to graduate with a PhD in history at Auburn. That's a huge deal and this is 2021 and yet and yet this is a big deal okay higher education for women is really really important because when women are also educated in the same way that men are they can compete for jobs suffrage you guys know what suffrage is it's the right to vote in political elections well 
women's women are granted the right to vote in several democracies in the united states the U women get the right to vote by the 19th amendment okay that happens in technically 1919 but also technically 1920 just write down 1920 all right. In after World War II, the United States forces the Japanese to give women the right to vote. So in 1945, upon surrendering, the U.S. will force the Japanese to allow women the right to vote. Go us. In India in 1947, after the partition, Indian women will be given the right to vote. This is important. One man, one woman, one vote. All right. Voting is important, guys more increases in human rights in the 1990s a man named nelson mandela is going to lead the charge in south africa to end apartheid all right apartheid is an extremely brutal version of segregation all right south africa was led by white people even though the majority of the population were people of color all right apartheid made sure that people of color were not able to gain power Right, they were not able to use the same facilities. It was a very, very awful, awful version of segregation. Because of Nelson Mandela and because of his nonviolent protests inspired by Mahatma Gandhi, apartheid will come to an end. Okay. Now, other organizations will help increase human rights as well. You guys might not have heard of this one, but the World Free Trade Organization, not to be confused with the World Trade Organization, is going to spread something called fair trade, okay? Y'all, every morning I go and get Dunkin' Donuts and I buy a cup of coffee for about $2.50, okay? Dunkin' Donuts buys those coffee beans from farmers in Colombia for like 10 cents. Okay, that's not fair trade. All right, sure, it costs Dunkin' Donuts some money to ship those coffee beans to the United States, but that's not really fair. And what the fair trade organization does is it sort of levels the playing field. So instead, if Dunkin' Donuts is gonna charge me 250, they should be paying the farmers more money, okay? That is what fair trade is all about. And that is a human rights um, that is part of human rights, okay? Paying people fair wages. There's also an increase in human rights in environmental organizations. I'm sure many of you have heard of Greenpeace, okay? Yeah, we can laugh at some of the things that Greenpeace have done, but Greenpeace is an environmental organization that is protesting the consequences of global warming, all right? Um, they are protesting environmental consequences of this new economic system of global integration. As I told you in the last class, burning petroleum, nuclear energy, all this stuff has had consequences. And the consequences has meant a warmer world. All right, well, Greenpeace is part of the protest movement against that. While Greenpeace is not anti-globalization, they want to find new solutions to this burning of fossil fuels and natural gas in order to kind of keep keep nature and keep the world you know safe from this this global warming epidemic okay guys this was a pretty short lesson i know that but congratulations you have finished unit nine please send me an email if you have missed class i do want to let you know what you've missed make sure you catch up on your grades all right Congratulations, guys. We have finished. I am proud of you and you should be proud of yourselves. Okay. I will see you guys later and have a great rest of your day.